All right, friends, we are going to get started with our program. Um, my name is Shruti Bhatnagar. I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Montgomery County Group. We have an amazing lineup of speakers today. Really appreciate all of you taking the time to join us. I want to first uh, introduce uh, the moderators that I have, and then we will each be introducing one of the panelists. I have with me Ling Tang, my colleague from Sierra Club, Montgomery County. Ling is our Natural Places team uh, lead and also on our executive committee. And then we have Jeannie Braha from Rock Creek Conservancy and Stormwater Partners Network. So Jeannie, would you like to introduce one of our panelists today? I would as soon as I figure out how to unmute myself. Um, thanks so much to everyone for being here and for um, uh, for all the wonderful questions I'm sure we're going to hear from you. I am delighted and honored to introduce my Stormwater Partners Network colleague, and I'm, dare I say, mentor, Kit Gage. Um, Kit is the interim president of the Friends of Sligo Creek and also the Friends, Sli uh, pardon me, advocacy director. I'll also mention that she is on the steering committee of Stormwater Partners Network a Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, master watershed steward, and with a horticultural certificate from the Graduate School USA. Kit is active with the Friends of Storm, uh, Sligo Creek Stormwater Committee since 2005. She's also been active with Stormwater Partners Network since about that time, working at the county and state level to improve rules and regulations. Kit has a bachelor's from Grinnell College in allegedly good troublemaking, which I think is something we all should aspire to. Thank Link. you, Jeannie. Hi, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm really honored to be introducing Lauren Hubbard. Um, Lauren, I'm really thrilled that she can be here with us today. Uh, Lauren Hubbard is the owner of Native by Design, where she provides sustainable landscaping services, including design, coaching, small scale installation, and project management. She also operates a nursery that offers local ecotype native plants. In addition, Lauren's on the board of the Maryland Native Plant Society with a particular interest in preserving the genetic, bio, genetic diversity of native plants. Um, Lauren also launched the Butterfly Bandwagon Project, a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor information and resource sharing approach to promote and use support the use of native plants. She holds a PhD in plant biology is a certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, weed warrior supervisor, and a master garden gardener. Thank you, Ling. And with that, I have the honor and privilege to introduce Anne English. Anne is an expert on sustainable residential design and ecological stormwater management. She is the program manager for rainscapes at the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. Anne is responsible for developing and presenting a variety of program elements and overseeing the team responsible for implementing the Rainscapes program. She earned her BA in American History from UPenn, a Master's of Regional Planning from Penn State, and a Master's of Landscape Architecture from the University of Georgia. She also served on the Kids Gardening Advisory Board of the National Gardening Association for over a decade. Really excited to have this great panel with us today and also want to give a shout out and thank our uh, allies with Rock Creek Conservancy, with Friends of Sligo Creek and Stormwater Partners Network. It's so great working with you and thank you all for being here today with us. So without further ado, I want to pass it on to Anne English. Uh, thanks so much, Shruti. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and um, let's see if if this will uh, be efficient today. All right. And then I'm going to start as did it chair. Yes. Okay. And all right. So I'll show. Okay, can everybody see the first slide? Because I can't see you anymore. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to just, I'm going to roll with this and really want to talk about how my program helps people at home uh, work towards clean water goals and, and really 
wonder if you're wondering why we need to worry about it. I'll be looking at the um, it's not advancing. All right, let's see. There we go. Um, I want to just talk about what Montgomery County and DEP has done historically, and then then I'll shift into what are rainscapes and and um, what are the rebate levels and what's the process for applying for all those things. Um, so basically, we are in a county that's uh, 500 square miles, over a million people, um, 1,500 miles of streams, two major river basins, 184 spoken languages. We are a very diverse county, and about uh, basically every person living in Montgomery County lives within a half a mile of a stream. We have several programs that are aimed at watershed health. We have the big capital improvement programs, and then we have um, the smaller programs such as Rainscapes, Tree Montgomery, and Organic Lawns. And then we have other watershed programs, things like grants, pet waste, uh, trash awareness, and uh, cleanups. And our newest one is SaltWise. Um, as you look at the county and uh, impervious cover, uh, it's been bandied about actually 10 years ago, people in the general public had never heard of impervious cover. Basically that means the conversion of land to residential or urban uses. Um, and you can see that uh, the percent impervious, uh, Sligo Creek, uh, some areas are as high as uh, 41 to 45% impervious and uh, other parts of the county are more like in the uh, one to 10% impervious. So our overall for the county looks okay, like 12 and a half. But um, when you look at, when you get down to the local level, you see that certain uh, watersheds are much more uh, covered over with buildings and roads. And of course, if you live in those areas, you're aware of that. So how have we changed our watersheds? Well, here's Norbeck Road. Um, back in 1951, and the, the future Earl B. Wood Middle School site is labeled. And so you can see it was a forest, and it was a forest everywhere. Maryland was a forest environment. But now it looks like a suburban development. Aspen Hill, of course, is a relatively large lot compared to some areas, but you can see the number of trees and that has gone way down, and so has the amount of rooftops and roads. So what's the big deal from all this imperviousness? Well, we get people dumping things illegally. We have um, pipes, the storm drain pipes that are discharging untreated water into our streams that uh, the poor turtle there in the stream is trying to make a living there. Very hard to do with all that uh, blast of water coming in, which also carries plastics um, and other debris. Pet waste gets hung up when people unthoughtfully put their pet waste bags down by the side of the trail thinking someone's going to pick it up. So this mess is all around us and you can see it on a windy day. You could see it um, when you are looking in the water and if you've been in a healthy watershed um, and you, you're not happy, happy, happy when you look around, you start to get very, very sad. I have to say though, you know, Montgomery County has really been working to moderate the impacts from all that runoff. This is up in Olney. And this is when people really start to sit up and pay attention. They start to see their uh, streams turning into trenches they start to see their yards being eroded and they start to become alarmed. So what's the county doing? Well, we are monitoring the stream health. We have an excellent, both in parks and DEP, stream monitoring programs that are looking at uh, the benthic macroinvertebrates um, and to measure stream health because certain, certain critters are more sensitive and um, certainly uh, it's been found that they can be used as a proxy for any kind of more expensive chemical um, evaluation with water samples. So we had all that imperviousness and if you reflect back to what that looked like and then you start to look at stream health, you start to see that down in the lower parts of the county the stream health is worse than in the upper part of the county and there is a direct correlation between amount of impervious cover and stream health. Uh, so what's the county do to help? We all, we 
have a number of programs that we've been working to develop, rainscapes. Um, we've worked, we have implemented things for flooding in the past uh, through a big capital improvements effort with stormwater ponds. We've done stream restoration through that approach and then we've monitored the results. And then we've tried to engage the community because ultimately it's gonna take a, a, a full force effort, not only from the government, but from individuals. The stormwater management uh, inspection program is uh, was state mandated, and it is one of the best. It, we're very thorough. Uh, this follows up on the the uh, inspections that were mandated to do every three years of all the facilities that are public and privately owned, or if they're in the right of way. These are the other projects that we've done, and then we have these uh, stewardship type opportunities. You can get free trees through the tree law fund, which funds Tree Montgomery. You can educate your neighbor about pet waste management. Uh, we have the pesticide law, um, which means that you're not supposed to apply lawn pesticides. We have stream cleanups. We've had geocache efforts. We've had storm drain marking efforts. And we've also had a whole series and growing um, presence of community grant efforts. So I'm going to switch to, uh, I'm going to drop out of this and switch to Kit because we haven't done this alone. We've done this, uh, we've, we've really leaned into the community to find out the, the opinion of people in the community as to what types of programs might help both raise awareness and increase effectiveness in our effort. Um, thanks, Ann. Um, absolutely. Um, I've been working with Friends of Sligo Creek with our stormwater committee. And what we've done, um, we started working with the Department of Environmental um, Protection with uh, Ann English from the very beginning and several other folks. And it's been, um, we've worked collaboratively to try to figure out ways of doing uh, stormwater work in a way that was um, that was going to that the community would adopt that the community would want to adopt so we knew that we needed to have a, a way to deal with that because um, the, the county clearly can't do all this by itself so we've got to do a bunch of stuff so how do we get ourselves uh, involved how do we get how do we encourage our neighbors and other groups to get involved and so we uh, we trial and errored several different kinds of projects early on from 2005 to maybe 2010. Uh, we helped uh, the county think about how to assess neighborhoods, whole neighborhoods, to figure out where uh, projects would best go in. Um, we worked early on with um, the, uh, uh, the Green Street project, suggesting that uh, it was a critical piece of, of having green streets. If you don't know what green streets are, they are looking at a whole neighborhood, taking a whole neighborhood, evaluating it and putting in stormwater projects in the rights of way. So not in people's yards so much, but along <coughs> the street. So, but we recognize that to do that, you had to have collab, it was a collaborative project. So for example, in my neighborhood, we worked every step of the way with DEP and turned out to be also DO, Department of Transportation, to make sure that there was buy-in from the neighbors. Um, we've also in more recent years worked uh, through the, the grant program that the county, um, the county funds to help neighborhood organizations and institutions do projects, but in the process, help them, help them do the projects. So we, there's a grant project, we may help to supervise it, we may help to be a liaison, we give advice, we get make sure that the, that the, the neighbors are in, involved and supportive of the projects. Um, so it's really, um, it's kind of a soup to nuts relationship, but it's there, it's been there from the beginning and we, we've developed a level of trust between each other to, to understand that we're, you know, even though we can be critical of each other, we're in this for the common good. Um, so that makes the criticisms more functional because there, the DEP knows that when we have a suggestion or a criticism, it's because we're trying to figure out ways of making 
these projects work. Um, I'm going to send it back to Anne. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again and we'll get rolling. So uh, the Rainscapes program um, is a little broader than just rebates, but the rebates are definitely um, the way that people have heard about us most recently. Um, we do have a, a growing program where we're growing plants that we get from Pope Farm using high school greenhouses. Um, and then we've given away those plants. Um, and we talk, we've done a lot of presentations um, over the last decade or so on just watershed health and how to rethink your yard, how to do something different. Because the reality is, whether it's a rain garden or a conservation landscaping project, or you're retrofitting your driveway with something that allows the water to soak in instead of um, run down your driveway into the storm drain system or, or straight into the creek, um, the, it, people just don't know where to start. And we've been there to be that helping hand, kind of like um, landscape architecture extension. All right, let's see if this will switch. It's being very glitchy. Um, but basically, Ken Mack, who's one of our biologists, has said that increased infiltration is the first step in restoring some of the natural processes that have been lost over the past 130 years. So think about that, that picture I showed you of um, the, the land cover change that's happened in our county, where we used to be a forest, and now we're suburban urban in ever increasing areas, uh, there just isn't a lot of places for the water to soak in. All right, let's see. Let's see. This is really frustrating. Community grants, I did that one. It doesn't want to go further. Okay, so this is this. Uh, uh, all right, we'll just go with this. So basically, at every point along the flow path, we want water to have a chance to pause and soak in, to be uptake you know, through a plant, as opposed to the old model of the solution to pollution is dilution, whisk it away efficiently. We want this to be inefficient. We want to lengthen the flow path. And that's going to provide more opportunities to grow things and to restore the hydrology of our, of our streams. All right, let's see if I, so the Rainscapes projects, you can look this up online. You can see people in the Southern part of Montgomery County have been very interested in this. I wanna just run through some pictures of what they look like. How do you get from a lawn to something that'll soak it up? That's what our program is all targeted to build, showing how native plants manage stormwater building enough projects through uh, developing small landscapers through our training so that we now have a whole series of landscapers that are qualified to offer the service to install these things. And that was not the case in 2009. People have gotten very excited by the uh, opportunity to cost share with the county with the, through the rebate projects. So these pictures I'm showing you are all rebate projects. Um, this is a project where someone uh, started with one project and then came back and did two more. Um, our limits have increased to $7,500 and that's made it more possible. We've talked to people about leaving standing in vegetation in the winter so the birds can have something. Um, we've converted landscapes with, uh, first we did some demonstration projects through our uh, neighborhoods program. And so this is what we did. And then what did uh, the property owner came back and did even more. So basically success breeds success, right? People like to move from, one, from something that they knew to something that they can know if they're gonna be successful. Okay, my slides are just being crazy. But we have dealt with lots of lot drainage. Um, this particular uh, lady, has 12 houses that dump their water into her backyard. She's at the low point. Um, this cost share was about 29%. Took her 18 months from the time she applied to finish. Um, but 
It's a half acre that's draining of impervious that is draining into her yard. It's two acres once you throw in the yard area. So yeah, it's not, it's, it's managing, you would say, you know, 0.15 inches, um, but that's helping Rock Creek. You know, every little bit matters. This is another project. You see the pink roofs on the bottom left. Those are um, roofs that are draining to this backyard. And so there's a, a entry garden, so to speak, where the fence is, and then the slope is converted from grass to a native planting. And this was done underneath the direction of my planners. We've also worked in moderate income uh, condominium communities, particularly down in the Sligo uh, watershed, but uh, in the Anacostia area um, to manage parking lot water, whether it is, um, and we have provided technical backup for the grant projects uh, that are in the same category. This is a very recent project at National Park Seminary, had a lot of complexity, an unbelievable infestation of invasive plants, took quite a bit of uh, five different agencies got involved because of the historic nature of the property, the scale of the prop project, but it's got a huge drainage area all going into Rock Creek and the seed bank that was going into Rock Creek um, has been greatly improved by this project. And the community is very pleased with the, with the results. People have used it as a way to disconnect their driveways from the right of way. The, uh, this project, um, 1150 square feet, the house on the left, the one on the right was a, a little bit smaller, but um, both of them were right around 20% cost share. And the, the reason it says impervious area is zero, that means that these two projects didn't put their roofs into the um, pavement. Um, but the, so the area, the drainage area of 1150 square feet was the same as the project area. Okay, let's see if I can get to the next one. We've experimented with soils. Um, one of the concerns that we started with was really, and I, I'm just not even gonna go back, but we, maybe I am, but basically we started with a focus on runoff reduction. In addition to runoff reduction, we're now starting to really appreciate the value that this uh, program can bring to the climate action plan because our projects sequester carbon. We have a new stormwater permit as of November, 2021. Uh, the county uh, is working hard, both through accounting and projects to find out how we're gonna meet that 1,805 impervious acre goal. Uh, and it will be done through a suite of, of opportunities and initiatives, both on the capital side and on the operations side and uh, community work. You know, beyond stormwater management, rainscapes provide habitat, they improve air quality, they reduce heat island effects, save energy, they have benefits for human health. And so uh, they look nice. People are very surprised to find out that something that manages stormwater can look nice. Uh, right now we are closed for new applications. We'll be opening on the 1st of February. Uh, that's the current plan. We are oversubscribed, but we are getting one more staff member. You can get up to $7,500 on a single family uh, or individual parcel, even in a townhome. Um, so uh, this is really frustrating. Um, HOAs, businesses, and congregations up to 20,000. And you can see in this chart, um, in the interest of time, I'll probably just PDF this and send it if you're interested, but you can see the percent uh, cost share ranges typically from 24 to 51% as of last February. We've posted all our requirements, what documents we need, what size they are, it's all online. So even though we're not accepting applications, there's plenty of time to educate yourself. We have many resources. We have planting design templates. We have you know, how to draw a plan. We have recommendations for how to get started with plants if you've never grown these plants. We have sizing guidance. Um, 
we've mapped out our process into like the TurboTax version. We, we have recommendations on what you should look for in a professional. Um, these guides have been very popular. Uh, the master gardeners liked them so much, they basically made their own versions. Um, we have plant spacing guidance for, for landscapes where water is flowing through them. They need to be planted a little differently. And you can also download our spreadsheet. It's got a plant quantity estimator that's very quick. Uh, these are the, what the templates look like in terms of their book. And this is, if you've never designed a garden, this might be a good place to start. We have many lists of plants that perform, and I'm sure um, Lauren will talk more about that. And then basically, when you get started, you have to remember, you have to look at your site and figure out exactly where your problems are and what your priorities are. And then it's good to apply. You, it would be nice if you had a plan in hand, but if you don't, that's okay. We understand that uh, that's part of what we're offering to people. So the first steps are on the purple sheet and it describes each type of project. And then the application process is on the blue sheet. It's also a one, two, three. And then the application portal is on the right uh, once you get a chance to apply. And you can click on those hot links on the right side to get to the requirements pages if you haven't seen them before. It's very important uh, on your, when you're doing a planted project that you allow enough time given our workload right now. So if we suggest that you submit six months before you want to install, um, we used to be able to turn around a lot faster, but uh, right now we have so many projects that we're juggling. It, we want to be uh, clear and uh, not lead people into a false expectation that if they submit it today, they'll have an approval within, you know, hours. So uh, if you want to find a pro, we publish our list of people that come to our classes. Um, we typically have offered classes in Brookside. Uh, we do have on, there's a DEP YouTube channel that has some of our classes on them. And, it, you know, we basically, we try to go with the flow. Wherever the, the energy is leading, that's where we're going to. We're looking for innovation. Uh, we are open to, um, evaluation and comment, and we've gotten a lot of nice feedback from uh, people over the years. Um, well, this is one of my favorite quotes from Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, she said, the environment is where we all meet. It's where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing all of us share. It is not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens on what we can become. And just as a reminder that clean water starts in the garden. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren. All right. Thanks, Anne. That was wonderful. Um, I will share that uh, I direct people to the Rainscapes website all the time for those really great resources. It's a very nice collection of materials for you to use. Um, I'm going to get my... Um, Program sharing here and hold on, got hidden. I'm start. Okay, there we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see plants and biodiversity. So my my topic I was asked to present on is plants and biodiversity. So I don't actually have a whole lot of uh, specific plants to share with you today, although you'll see some in some of these images. Um, I'll just jump along here. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off. What I wanted to talk about today is, you know, why be, beyond stormwater, which is a huge issue here, there's a many co-benefits to using native plants in your landscaping. And I'm just going to start with this really basic, uh, you know, coverage of the food web, because that's really at the heart of all of this. Plants are these primary producers here collecting sunlight and passing that energy through to all the other critters. So if you don't have the right plants, you don't have everything else. So that's the crucial kind of basis for all of the, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and it, and it really, it also comes back to the fact that it turns out that many of our insects are quite specific in what they need to eat. Um, this monarch caterpillar, for example, as you probably already know, can only eat milkweed plants. And that is turns out to be true for some 90% of all 
moths and butterflies as cat in their caterpillar phase, they can only eat a very specific set of plants. And also true for most of our native bee species, something like 30 to 50% are pretty specific in the kinds of flowers that they have to visit in order to get food. And what we know from research across the globe and also even locally, so for example, here's a study from New Hampshire that our insect populations are in decline. Um, they've fallen in this particular forested patch 80% since 1970. One in four bumblebee species in North America is in decline or threatened with extinction. This sort of information is true, you know, across the board for, for uh, native bees and, and all kinds of other um, the moths and, and, and butterflies. It's not good news. <clears throat> and if you lose the insects, you can imagine that you also lose birds. So we've, we're down nearly 3 billion birds since 1970. This is not a good sign and we need to do something about it. So what's going on, it's, um, if you look at chickadees as an example, and this is Doug Ptolemy's research, if you're not familiar with him, I do encourage you to look up one of his videos or watch him in a lecture, he's a wonderful speaker. Um, but he has found that if a chickadee requires 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one clutch of baby birds. That's an awful lot of caterpillars you need to raise that uh, one, just one little nest. And if you don't have enough plant material that's the right kind of plant material, you won't maintain a chickadee population. What his research found is that you need to have 70% of the plants in your yard as, as native plants. And the reason is going back to that really specific uh, connection of the insects to a particular type of plant. The plants that they've co-evolved with are the ones that they can eat, and those are going to be your native plants. So you need 70% native plants to maintain a population of chickadees. And this is sort of like the lab rat thing, right? This, is, this chickadee is an example of one type of, of bird that needs that many caterpillars and they feed caterpillars to the babies because they're nice and soft and squishy and full of fat. Um, but this is gonna apply across the board. So that's why we have such a big loss of, of birds. So just a quick you know, review of terms, biodiversity referring to the, all the living variation out there, including genes and traits and species and ecosystems. Like it, uh, early in my intro it was mentioned, I'm particularly interested in the biodiversity of our plant genome. So I want, our native plants to be biodiverse, even within a species. Um, I, uh, I talk about weeds. So weeds are really just plants growing out of place. It doesn't refer to whether or not they're native or not. But a native plant is a very specific type of plant that is developed in a place over hundreds of thousands of years in a particular region and is part of that ecosystem. Invasive plants are not native and they have specific traits that make them more likely to grow quickly, spread and disperse and disrupt uh, native plant communities. Um, when I refer to a native plant that is a fast growing native plant, I call it aggressive versus invasive to, to distinguish those things. So invasives are these non-natives while aggressive can be a native plant that just grows fast. And then I'll mention later on uh, cultivars are plants that have been bred for specific traits and that can matter the type of cultivar can matter as to how well it serves its role in the ecosystem. Uh, so some plants are better at making caterpillars than others. Um, this is again, Doug Ptolemy's research. And he, you can see that oaks are the best at making the most number of caterpillars. They can support over 500 different species of caterpillars. If you compare that with say a non-native crepe myrtle, for example, the number will be in the single digits. So there's a huge difference in the difference in the number of caterpillars that can be supported by a native versus a non-native plant. But some, even amongst the native, some are better at supporting um, wildlife than others. And this is true also for your herbaceous perennials and other natives that, in this case, the solidago or goldenrods are top of the list. And they, by the way, also are really great at supporting our native bees. And then I, I like to bring up even the specialists. So maybe you see that list and you want to plant all those plants, but you know, it's okay to plant some unusual other things because sometimes there's going to be a specialist that's going to need that other thing. So in this case, this particular bee can only use violets 
for its uh, when it's nectaring and collecting pollen. So even just having some unusual plant is going to support someone as long as it's native, right? So if you're picking a native plant, even if it's something that's not on the list, it's still good. Um, I like to point out the difference between uh, hosting caterpillars versus a nectaring plant. So in this case, we have a fritillary butterfly nectaring on a butterfly weed, which is a native type of milkweed. This butterfly, however, its host plant is a violet like shown in the earlier picture. So it's caterpillar feeds on the leaves of the violets, but it, nect it can nectar on lots of things. And that's important when I have people tell me, oh, but I love my, my butterfly bush, which is a non-native. It sounds kind of like this plant, but it's totally different. It's a bush, it's, it's tall, it's got purple or white flowers, and it's often covered in lots of butterflies when it's flowering, but the leaves don't support any caterpillars. So you're only supporting half of the life cycle. So if you're looking at your garden and thinking about biodiversity, it's much better to use natives because then you're gonna actually support the whole life cycle. And then back to the cultivar um, comment. So some the cultivars are bred and, and inbred basically, they cross back to themselves and maintain a specific trait that's kind of unusual or unique. And in this case, I'm showing you an example of the nine bark shrub. Um, the cultivar here is called Diablo. If you were to go to a nursery and see the name, it would say Physocarpus opulifolius, and then in parentheses, Diablo. That's how you know when you have a cultivar is when you have those parentheses and then some other name. And this particular cultivar has dark leaves. And this is not such a great thing because it's another research project by Doug Ptolemy. He found that if you look at cultivars for various traits, things that impact the ability of insects to feed are changing the leaf color because that's a chemistry change within the leaf and changing the flower shape or um, color. So you wanna avoid those kinds of changes. Dwarfing the plant didn't seem to matter too much. You know, Changing branching structure or something like that doesn't matter too much. But if you change the leaf color or the flower shape or the flower uh, color, then that really uh, was a negative for insect feeding. So if you're thinking again about your yard as a, as a you know, arc of biodiversity, you wanna go with what's called the straight species. And then here's another example. So this was a, a Rudbeckia with the, this is the straight species here. And then this is a cultivar, cultivar called butterfly kisses. And you can see a very different, um, structure going on in the center that's going to reduce the amount of access to pollen and nectar. And that's really a negative for insects because they arrive thinking it's something they can use and then they have to go away empty handed. So they just expended a bunch of energy and didn't get anything in return. Beyond that, I also like to uh, remind you to look at your eco region. We live, most of us here in the Piedmont, um, uh, it kind of depends on where you are in this uh, map, but uh, trying to pick plants that are really uh, you know, native to your eco region. And then not only that, but an ecotype. So an ecotype is a, a plant that has been, uh, the seeds been collected locally and grown from, and not just something from a nursery that was collected, but you know, it was a living wild locally. Seeds are collected that has to be done with permits and properly, and then grown out and sold back to the public. And two places that I recommend going to get those kinds of plants are Chesapeake Natives and Earth Sangha. Both of these are nonprofit organizations. They're great groups trying to do this really important work. And this is about preserving the genetic diversity of our local plant populations. My little tiny nursery also does native ape types, but I'm so small that I don't advertise. So <laughs> I don't have a lot to sell, but I'm working on it. Um, and finally, I'll just share a few resources uh, that will help you on this journey. Um, bringing nature home is uh, Doug Ptolemy's first book, I highly recommend that and any of his others for that matter. And again, go hear him speak to be a little bit more inspired. Of course, the Rainscapes program is awesome. It also is available in the municipalities of Rockville and uh, Gaithersburg. Uh, this is a helpful guide to plants that are native to our region. So it's a way to kind of more quickly narrow your focus and you can find that as on the web nativeplantcenter.net. Um, 
a great book on uh, pollinators by Heather Holmes, if you're interested in learning more about insects, which often happens when you get involved with native plants because you see all these unusual insects that you've never seen before. Get to know your invasives so you know what to remove. That's a huge part of this project. And then if you uh, wanna get uh, help um, besides you know, finding a professional, uh, Wild Ones is an organization that promotes the use of native plants in landscaping. We have our local chapter, the Chesapeake chapter, and the group has plant swaps, and they are great about sharing resources and giving garden tours and helping each other. So all of these things can help you as you're trying to figure out what to do in your own yard. Um, I love the Rainscapes program. We're very fortunate to have this here in Montgomery County. I used to live in New York and we did not have anything to help us monetarily. So it's really useful to have this uh, driving these projects forward. Um, thank you to the Sierra Club for hosting this program and I will end right there. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Kit. This was so informative and interesting. I really enjoyed the presentations and all the information that you shared, and I hope so did our audience. Uh, and with that, I'll actually, uh, I and have a question for Anne that came in the chat. Can you explain what you mean by cost share? Uh, okay, so uh, the rewards program is a true rebate. And this means that you have to pay the money and then you submit your receipts. And then uh, based on a cost per square foot basis or gallon basis, um, there's a rebate. When you go into your project, when you're approved, you're approved for a certain amount of money. Um, sometimes, you know, plus or minus a few dollars, um, but it's based on receipts. So, for example, you if you're approved for $660 because you're going to harvest 660 gallons and it's a dollar a gallon, um, you but you only spent $527 uh, discounting tax, um, you would not get $660, but you would get 100% back in that case. Uh, by the same token, if you were approved for a 200 square foot garden and you became inspired to do a 400 square foot garden um, and you found the money to do that, but you didn't uh, confirm with your planner that there was gonna be money to cover that, there's no guarantee we can um, cover a greater amount. So it's very important to go through our approval process first. Um, it saves a lot of headaches. It's really good to get the whoever's designing the landscape uh, and the owner and rainscapes on the page. And uh, then the project goes much smoother and uh, things can get processed better with a minimum heartache. Thanks, Anne. And um, I was delighted to see so many Rock Creek examples in your slide deck. Thanks for everything you're doing for Rock Creek and the rest of our waterways. I want to note a few people have asked in the chat about um, resources, lists of contractors or others who can help with rainscapes or rainscape style projects. And there are some great links that have been added with um, a, a resource list there. But I wanted to ask, and maybe kind of following up on your last question, um, the rebates are quite generous in Montgomery County, as you noted, but the price tags are still pretty high for um, a lot of people. How is the county thinking about making the program more accessible to those who maybe can't put in a, a big capital outlay for this type of program, but might be in significant need? Right, so, uh, so this is a very interesting question. And it's something we're definitely grappling with. Um, we used to have, for example, on conservation landscapes, we used to have a minimum square foot of 500 square feet that you were converting, and that equated to a front yard. And for that, we had a $1 a square foot uh, rebate. And it was really aimed at a do-it-yourself kind of concept. And it was predicated, you know, the, the, there was a California turf conversion to native plant rebate that was at that level. And the public told us that 500 square feet was too much. So we dropped our minimum size to 250 square feet. What happened when we increased our rebate maximum from, we removed the $500 cap and we said, we could give more money back to you. 
So that was up to $1,200. And then we had doubled our rebates to 2,500. And then we said up to 7,500 because we didn't want to keep incrementally going up. So in 2018, um, we raised it to 7,500. So what's happened in the interim, our average size of project has mushroomed. So by it, it, the smaller projects that are do it yourself actually get pretty well covered because people with their sweat equity, it balances out. Um, but the, the financing is part one problem that we're looking at. And the Green Bank has not been accessible to us, but we're there have been some changes in the Green Bank and we're gonna look at that so that just like people finance their windows, you know, over, with 0% interest, maybe there's a way to subsidize interest so that people could take a short-term loan to get it in and then they could pay, pay it back and then have no interest. So that's one idea that we're looking at. You, we have a neighborhoods program where we paid 100%. Those, uh, and we had a range of um, neighborhoods that were in both Anacostia and Rock Creek because those were our priority watersheds under our previous permit. And they were a mix of um, more moderate income residents and um, maybe more heavily environmentally impacted neighborhoods. So, um, but what's happened, of course, is a neighborhood that was a moderate price neighborhood before is now a more expensive neighborhood because you know prices have just gone through the roof. In terms of how to make it more affordable. Um, I don't have the answer, but this is something that we are definitely uh, preparing to ask people. Certainly the grant program, we've steered um, larger communities and congregations and, you know, community pools even to work with the nonprofit to do uh, a project on a grant basis. And we, we have, uh, we're thinking about, uh, we have some frontline communities that have been identified where we might be able to use some of the new EPA money uh, to do just some demonstration projects there. But that's all very much in flux right now because we still don't have the rules as to how that money can be spent. I will say that last year, um, there was a question about, are we spending all our money? Yes, we are spending all our money and borrowing from other programs. We had over $682 um, and the average rebate was about 3,700. So we are quite aware, at least I'm quite aware that we are in people's household budgets. And so if, if people don't have the money or if they're renting and they're, their person who owns the property is not cooperative, those projects aren't happening there. And that was part of the basis um, initially for having school-based projects. Um, and then uh, because you know, it's a broader community that sees it. It's also was part of the basis for having congregational outreach because there's so much impervious on congregational properties. So um, there are programs like this in Prince George's County, Rain Check is it's administered by the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Our rebate, I believe is the highest in the, in the country. Um, Prince George's I think is 6,000 is their upper limit. Thank you. Did Anne. that answer your question? Thank you, Anne. I'm glad to hear uh, Montgomery County is a leader on this <laughs> cost-wise. Um, I have a question uh, from Dave. He asked, can rainscape type project be used to meet state requirements to reduce sediment and pollution discharge into the waterways? Yeah, they are um, submitted as part of our annual reporting all the projects that we do, and uh, they have been included in our new single family home um, private property inspection program. So every three years they're supposed to be inspected. And anyone that has a project in can apply for a water quality protection charge credit um, because they have a stormwater BMP on their property. Thank you. I don't know if this question already got answered, but I know Maureen said something about if it's possible to submit your request for approval now. Say that again, I'm sorry. Is it possible to submit your request for approval now? Or do we have to- No, we are. Until... Yeah. Yep. Yeah, February uh, 1st is when we are targeting opening again. You know, 
the budget for rebates was 375,000. So we spent about twice as much for the last two years running because of shifting funds, the ability to shift funds within the department. And that of course can't be sustained. And we've asked for more money and we are, are getting a fourth planner. Um, we're in the process of working on getting that through the approvals um, to handle the demand. Each one of my planners is juggling about a hundred projects. So there's only so many projects one person can oversee. But part of the reason we're pretty stringent about what our requirements are is because we do submit them to the state. Um, I think the, some of the most exciting ideas that, um, you know, the synergy with the climate action plan and rainscapes um, is provides some maybe some justification for doing a few things differently. And this might be a way forward. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, well, I don't see any other questions, but I will still oh, open Shruti, um, uh, I think there's some more questions. I think there, yeah, if I, yeah. if I may, and Anne, at some point, I think we'd all love to hear a little bit more about how you think the, the connection to the Climate Action Plan works, but there was a question, um, I believe it was from Maxine, about, um, broadly about native plants, and maybe this is for Lauren also, about where to, where there are native plant nurseries in Montgomery County. Um, I know you shared a couple on your, your screen, but more generally there was, uh, Maxine wanted to know about, um, more about the native plants or rainscapes being grown in school greenhouses that you mentioned, Anne. And um, she asked, how, how could a master gardener get involved in that? So maybe Lauren, if you wanna talk nurseries first, and then we can ask Anne to get to the master gardening. Thank you. Yeah, sure, so great question. Um, so there's not a local ecotype nursery in Montgomery County. However, I failed to mention that uh, Pope Farm, which is a county production facility, is not really open to the public, but they do host sales of local ecotype plants through the parks. So in fact, it was just this last weekend through Locust Grove Nature Center. So if you keep an eye on that, you can catch it. They have usually one in the spring and the fall. And then I, I do work for Muddy Branch Alliance. We've been hosting a local ecotype sale, um, usually in the spring next year. I'm not sure if it's gonna be spring or fall, but you can keep an eye on that. And then beyond that, you can also go to your local nurseries in Montgomery County. And I encourage you to ask for na straight native species. I mean, there you ask for local ecotype, that's a stretch, but you know, why not? Um, I'll keep, I'll keep on that plan for as long as I live. Um, and then, you know, if you have to use cultivars, well, pick wisely. You, I've given you some metrics for that, you know, no changes in leaf color, no changes in flower or shape color, and then, you know, go for it. And using, it's often the case that even as in my designs, I end up using some dwarf shrub or something because that just needs to fit into a small landscape. So it's really pretty common that that happens. Um, so there are nurseries, uh, you can go to the Maryland Native Plant Society website and we have a pretty comprehensive list there that includes some places that are far afield, but especially for shrubs, for example, it's hard to get a lot of shrubs locally. So you end up kind of going a little further out for that. And then your, whoever, if you end up hiring a contractor, they're usually going to have a relationship with a supplier and they can provide you with plants if you're if you're using, if you're hiring someone to do an install, they're going to probably be able to help you source plants. But if you're doing it yourself, you can do these kinds of things um, by going to these websites and looking up nurseries. Thank you. I, I'd just like to add in terms of uh, shrub cultivars, many of the shrub cultivars are selections found in the wild and then they were, they've been bred. And most of them are propagated through cuttings which uh, speaks to Lauren's concern about biodiversity. But, you know, if you're just starting out with plants, it is really good to get some success under your belt. So these plants are plants that humans don't kill. You know, the, they're tough and they're, they're successful in a, um, a gardening setting. Um, and it's also helpful, particularly in plants where there's a male and a female, to have to have that cultivar name, um, so that you know that you have the right pair, so you get the fruit that you want, for example. So I think that um, 
anytime you're trying to make something complex, very simple and absolute, you always find the exceptions. Um, and certainly if it doesn't have a plant pattern on it, um, it might just be a selection out of the wild. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Lauren. I wanted to share um, a comment by, by Mark Imlay. He's our uh, expert naturalist at Sierra Club here. He said, did you know that there are native flowers in bloom every month of the year? The neighbors are happy. <laughs> and that please plant mushrooms and other fungi that are important to prevent stormwater runoff. And then I also yeah. have a question for uh, Lauren. Um, Lauren, Maryland passed the pollinator, pollinator protection law where retail retailers may not sell neonic pesticides due to the concerns that the uh, insecticides make all parts of the plant toxic to bees and pollinator. However, nurseries can still use neonics on plants they sell in, to the public. Do you have suggestions on how consumers can help encourage nurseries to carry neonic free plants? Um, well, I didn't know that little twist in the plot there. So that's interesting. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, you need to ask when you go to buy things, ask them, but, you know, whatever it is, whether it's asking for straight species or neonics or whatever, get informed. And I think, you know, it's really tempting. I've done it myself. You go to Home Depot because you're there to buy some hardware, some for some project, and you have to go to the plant section because you know we're a bunch of plant people, and you want to buy the thing. And you have to be careful because it's hard. Their their staff is probably not going to know a whole lot about what they have and what's being applied. It's tricky. I mean, maybe they do, but it's probably a long shot that they won't. So going to a more reputable nursery that really specializes in you know, native plants is a better bet as a whole, just, just, you know, it's just a better choice. So try to try to frequent those places that are doing a good job, ask the questions that you need to ask to get the product that you want. Thank you, Lauren. Sure. I like that asking questions. So then I will ask a question to all our presenters and see if you have any closing comments to make. Uh, and I'll just start with Git and then Anne, and then Lauren. Um, sure, thanks. This is, uh, I'm delighted to have been part of this. Um, I guess that I would just close by encouraging people to get involved um, in your local watershed group, uh, just because there's often a lot of expertise. If you're a beginning planter, if you don't know about native plants, there's often a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people who can be of, of great of great help. And also if you're trying to make community change, county change, state change, that's often a way to, to get those change. And for example, we're, you know, we're working now to, uh, to uh, pass a forest conservation bill that would limit how many trees get cut down. And, you know, sort of a critical piece of the, of this whole stormwater puzzle is don't cut down what you, you know, what's, what's already there. So, I mean, that's, that's out of, kind of out of topic, but it's exactly on point to, to the kinds of big thinking that we need to have. Thank you. Looking at Anne, are you still there and want to add any closing remarks? Uh, Lauren, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, thank you for having me. I've been, it's been great to be part of this too. And I love that people are going for it. I love that the Rainscapes program is oversubscribed. That's a really great sign. Um, I'm going to jump on Kit's uh, remarks and say, you know, what I think we all need to be doing more of is advocating for these programs, right. for more money, for more support. Um, because it does take, you know, it, it's a heavy lift, right? And it really needs to be happening more. We, I, the recent reports about the Chesapeake Bay's uh, water quality are not great. We continue to decline. And it's, it's a, we're kind of behind the curve, basically. That's the problem here. We try, we're throwing more money at it, but we're behind. So we need to be doing all of this faster, bigger, better. So to the extent that we can all advocate, 
at the political level, um, we should be doing that and doing it in our own yards. So. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lauren. And uh, since Kit mentioned the forest conservation, I'm just going to put in the chat the link to the ANS, Audubon Naturalist Society blog page, um, Sierra Club Montgomery County, Forest Friends of Sligo Creeks. I mean, there's so many organizations that are Rock Creek Conservancy, uh, part of the for Montgomery County Forest Coalition. And we've been advocating for strong forest conservation law. There is a bill that's coming up, uh, 2522, that will um, that is being in, that has been introduced, and the hearing will be coming up pretty soon in early October. So please do uh, support the advocacy for this and um, write to your council members about uh, having strong forest conservation law. You can read all about it on the blog. So I see you, Anne. Did you wanted to uh, add any closing comments? Yeah, everybody's been frozen, um, and uh, it was nice to hear some sound. Um, so I, I missed whatever was said in that chunk. So, um, but I will say that 85% of property is in private hands. This means that the solution to both runoff issues and climate, and climate is intertwined with runoff because our area is going to get more intense storms according to all the climate models. Um, our skills have been destroyed through development and need to be reinvigorated with biology uh, through plant roots and the whole processes to, in order to get that soil to behave like a sponge, what soil is left that hasn't eroded away, but 85% is in private hands. That means that 85% of the work has to be done in cooperation with the government or independent of the government, but on private property. And a lot of that property, because in Montgomery County, because we've done an excellent job protecting our stream valley corridors, is upland property. So little projects where the projects are small, distributed network, once you, they all get in place, so that if one fails, there's a lot of redundancy. So, and it creates these pockets for these little pollinators to go from point A to B to C between the big nodes. So I encourage uh, you to think about your own space and start, start with a tree. Start with uh, converting a small patch of grass, but just get started. That's kind of where I'm at. We all have to do it. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Anne. And I will say this, probably preaching to the choir, because I know everybody on this call really cares about the environment and really cares about all these issues, but it never hurts to share this amongst friends, how important these issues are and how they intersect. And the climate change is a reality happening right here in our own neighborhoods. I mean, the flooding issue, I'm sure many of you or all of you followed that happened in the Rockville apartments that led to flooding and uh, disaster. I mean, it's right here in front of our eyes. And so each one of us can do our part in supporting the advocacy work that we are doing and planting more trees and looking at programs like this. And also looking at these issues from the perspective of equity and how it affects our BIPOC communities. What can we do to make sure that we are working closely with our allies and partners to reach into those communities, engage them, and make sure in our advocacy that we are um, bringing their voice along with the work that we are doing. So I really appreciate and have learned so much from all our allies and partners and other environmental leaders. And it's really great working with all of you. Um, so thank you for everything you do. Thank you to all our audience for joining us. And I know Ling, you wanted to uh, give a quick um, comment about also the work the Sierra Club Montgomery County Natural Places team is doing on this issue, correct? Yes, thank you, Shruti. Um, so Montgomery County Sierra Club has a natural places team. One of our issues is to work on the wildlife and plants corridor, which our state chapter spearheaded. Uh, the goal of the project is to create continuous areas like what Anne mentioned, mentioned um, like unbroken areas of native plants that wildlife can travel through, find food and habitat. And we're working to encourage residents to, to use native plants and to include their yard as part of this corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Ling. 
Uh, well, you will all receive a follow-up email soon. We will share the link of our recording and presentation, and you are always welcome to reach out, get more involved, ask your questions. But thank you again, everyone. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you to my co-moderators. Thank you to everyone who joined today. Uh, this was an amazing program. I learned so much, and I look forward to working with all of you. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you again.